But she's just at home. Well, yeah. In front of the fireplace. But that is mission control for lots of people, isn't it? For her. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, right, it's 8.52. He has sold more than 170 million books worldwide and is, of course, best known for his gripping historical fiction. Now, author Ken Follett is releasing the fifth and final novel in his best-selling Kingsbridge series. The Chronicle spans more than 800 years of history, but the final instalment exploring the 18th century industrial revolution. And Ken joins us now on the sofa. Good morning to you. Good morning. It's great so to be here. We've gone from outer space yes. back in time uh, to history. And you've dedicated this book to historians, haven't you? We're just yes. explaining why that. Well, do you know, sometimes I feel a little bit guilty because, you know, they do all the hard work in the dusty libraries and digging up archaeological stuff. And I just read their books and use the information. And uh, so I feel I owe them something. A an acknowledgement was the least I could do. Now, that's not true. I know you don't just read their books and use their information. I know that actually for this book, the research was really intense, wasn't it? You went. Did you not go and basically spend a week on the battlefield? Yes. There we Waterloo. go. At Waterloo. Yes. Well, the, the, the Battle of Waterloo comes towards the end of the book. And, you know, my readers don't want an awful lot of military history. But one battle in a book is quite good, especially at the end. But I have to understand it. Can't get it wrong. I oh, can't get it wrong, but I also have to understand it so that I can say in not too many words what the odds were, how the battle went. And Waterloo is particularly interesting because... Our side was losing by about mid-afternoon, and we were waiting for the Prussian army to arrive. And they didn't come, and they didn't come, and, and Wellington's looking at his watch. Where are those Germans? Uh, and they basically, they arrived about four o'clock in the afternoon and, and uh, basically saved the day. I mean, we celebrate this as a great British victory, which it was but the Prussians were really important. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, do you immerse yourself in all the detail, yeah. the history, and then write, or are you doing the two at the same time? They go together. So I spend about a year planning the book and doing the research. And so I'll be, I'll be working on the plan and I'll realise I, there's something I don't know enough about. Let's say it might be in the Industrial Revolution, it might be the Spinning Jenny. And so the next day I'll read a book about that. Uh, but while I'm reading that book, I'll, it, that book will give me more ideas for the story. So uh, that all comes together. It's quite a long process. It takes me a year, but at the end of the year, I'm ready to start writing. And your central character, Sal, yes. uh, is a spinner. Yes. And actually, her life is changed completely by the Industrial Revolution yes. in a very... And you do that in, like a, in a kind of a very small way. A very big thing happens. Exactly. Exactly. And... And, of course, my stories are all about people doing, having the normal challenges of life, you know, love and marriage and children and careers and money and war and violence. But I like it when all of that takes place against a background of some great historical change. And that's certainly what was happening end of the 18th century. Just as you said, Sally, it, people's lives were turned upside down by the new machines. And I know you, you praised historians who, who sort of proofread your work for saying, actually, this bit couldn't work quite like that, including with Sal and what she's able to do or would have been yeah. able to do as a woman at that time. Yes, that was, yes. And that's a little bit of a setback. When I've written the first draft, I show it to historians. I do pay them for doing that, actually, because they deserve it. And I'm making money. Why shouldn't they get something? So, and, and they, so I ask them to carefully read the first draft and make a report on any mistakes. And sometimes it's a problem because I had Sal. Sal becomes a bit of an activist in the city of Kingsbridge. And I had her chairing a, uh, a meeting to discuss reform of parliament. And the historian has said, no, you, a woman couldn't do that in the 18th century. It just would never have happened. People thought that it, look, the men would have said, no, 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 women should stay at home and do, you know the story, you know what they say. And uh, so I had to change that, so she had to be the power behind the scenes. So it works all right, but um, yeah, sometimes the historians prevent me from doing what I'd really like to do. But at least you avoid getting loads of letters afterwards from people saying, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, and this, this method of having five or six historians check the first draft does mean it's very rare for there to be a mistake historical mistake in my books. And isn't it interesting that the issues that you write about 
may have been hundreds of years ago, but mm. lots of them are still really relevant now. Oh my goodness! And um, well, uh, there was a technological revolution which we're going through now with artificial intelligence. There was uh, a terrible war in Europe, which we now have in Ukraine, and there was what we would now call a cost of living crisis. In the 18th century, it was just that the price of bread doubled, and, and that was devastating for families on a budget, you know. And it's, I mean, sometimes I feel a little bit depressed by, the, you know, the similarities between these historical periods. And trading and issues with Europe as well? That's yes, another that's exactly right. that, yeah. said, Well, when we were at war with France, we couldn't do business yeah. with France. So, I mean, you've been a bit political in your, in your past. Are you, are you trying to make a political point here, or are you trying to keep them two apart? You know, you can't do that, because the readers would know what I was up to in a, in a heartbeat. <laughs> and your proofreaders are catching if, that, yeah. If I tried to put, you know, Labour Party propaganda into a novel, I wouldn't have any readers left. No, you can't do that. In fact, I have to give the Conservatives some good lines because, um, uh, you know, I've got to do justice to them. So I sometimes give them the best line. There's a line in, in Edge of Eternity, the old um, aristocratic Tory is with his grandson, grown-up grandson in Berlin. And he says, and this is a great line for a Tory, he says, you know, we Conservatives were always right about communism. We said it would never work, and it never did. Good line, OK? And I've given it to the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Follett, thank you very much indeed. Like nearly 190 million books on? Yes, it's 191 million now. Oh, yeah. It's gone up again. Get the yeah. one. Well, it goes it's gone up this morning yeah. since this was written. Yeah. Yeah. Happily, yeah. it goes up all the time. Amazing. Wow, long may that continue. This is my second appearance on this show. Did you realise that? Is this it? morning. Go on. I, when your double was at Versailles, <gasps> yes. I was watching that on telly in my hotel room, yeah. and, and there I was. <laughs> you were against, at the dinner. I was where sitting, John was doing his extra job. Yes, I, yes. yes I didn't. I didn't realise. Congratulations on the <laughs> second job. There you are. <laughs> wow. Well, there we go. We will explain. That's you at Versailles. We'll explain what we're talking about a little bit later because uh, you've been in touch with some photos of your own. But Ken's book, The Armour of Light, is available from tomorrow. You're watching BBC Breakfast, it is 8.59. Now, the supermarket chain Aldi has released its latest financial results this morning, showing UK sales were up by nearly £2 billion in the year to the end of December 2022. Yeah, the supermarket chain says it's going to invest £1.4 billion over the next two years to expand its distribution and store networks. And the chief executive, Giles Hurley, has also been telling Emma Simpson that the cost of living crisis has changed our shopping habits permanently. In the last six months, food inflation has been coming down, but it is still tremendously challenging for customers out there. And I think more than ever, that's forcing customers to reappraise their grocery habits. You're pulling more shoppers in, but are they going to stick with you when this cost of living crisis is over? Well, I think the cost of living crisis has fundamentally changed the way the British public shop. 